I love that video. I think that little kid was wearing my shirt, though. It was a bigger size, of course, but I still think it had the same pattern. I don't know. I'll have to look it over. Anyway, if you're joining us online, uh, thanks for uh, joining us. And I'm Pastor Matt, and I'm wearing a shirt that a little kid on the video wore. So anyway, um, we're, have you ever done this? Have you ever taken an online test, like a personality test, maybe? Or maybe you took a, uh, an IQ test, and maybe you were disappointed with that. Or you, you, you took a, a, an emotional health test, or, you know... Or maybe you took a, you know, something more silly like uh, I like puppies or doggies or whatever or kittens test. Or maybe you did am I a psychopath test and you scored high on that. Unfortunately, it, there's all these tests that you can take, right? And you can rate yourself and find out where you fit in. Am I emotionally intelligent? Is this the right career path? And, you know, what's my personality type? Am I introverted, extroverted? All those different tests. Well, it's interesting. The book we're going to look at today in, in the New Testament, it's a letter. It's an epistle. That's what we're doing right now. We're going through the letters of the New Testament. We're going through the epistles. And uh, the one we're going to look at today is 1 John. And uh, you could turn to 1 John right now if you want to, because uh, that, that's where we're going to be. Uh, but it's a letter, and it's, the interesting thing about it is it's like a test. John writes it like a test, where you, what you're going to do is you're going to read through it and say, is that true of me or not? Is this true of me or not? Is this true of me or not? And he has a whole bunch of these questions, and uh, we're going to look at that. So let me give you a little background about 1 John. The first thing you know is it's written by John. He was the Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote three epistles, 1st John, 2nd John, and 3rd John. So next week, we're going to look at 2nd and 3rd John. We're going to cheat and do them both because they're only one chapter each next week. But this weekend, we're going to look at 1st John, which has five chapters. And it's kind of uh, like the rest of the epistles, but it's not like it in a way that a lot of the other epistles were written to certain regions, like to the Christians of Galatia, to the Christians of Ephesus, to the Christians of Rome, to the Christians of Corinth. So they were written to certain cities, to certain Christians. First John wasn't. It was just kind of written generally to the church and uh, to believers. And it, he, um, he asked questions. He, he essentially, the test is this. Are you somebody who calls yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, if you are, then this should be true. If it's not, then you ought to kind of call it into question. And, and so let me give you some examples of what I mean here, because uh, this will kind of give you an outline of the book. Um, for instance, if you read 1 John uh, 1, verses 6 through 7, he, John says, believers don't continue in sin. Their life isn't characterized by sin. They repent of their sin. They don't blame shift. They, they repent. They confess. Secondly, if you look at 1 John 2, verses 3 and 4, believers keep his commands. If you're a believer, you'll keep his commands. That's what they do. That's the natural way that they move. They want to please God, and they want to keep his commands. Jesus said once, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I've commanded you to do? Uh, the, the third thing we see is they love their Christian brothers and sisters, 1 John 2, verses 9 through 11. One of the characteristics of believers is they love their Christian brothers and sisters. Listen, every church is imperfect. This church is imperfect. Every church is imperfect. And it's interesting to me that people are you know, quick to criticize the church, but you better be careful because it's called the bride of Christ. And every church is imperfect, imperfect and it'll never be perfect. And, and, you know, you say, well, I don't like the church. The, you know, they're a bunch of hypocrites. Well, yeah, and you, if you went there, you'd, there'd be one more hypocrite. Because you're just as bad. I mean, and that's the thing. We don't see our own, you know, our own sin. And we don't see our own hypocrisy sometimes. We're very good at pointing it out at others. We're not very good at pointing it out and seeing it in ourselves. But he says that if you're a Christian, you'll love your brothers and sisters. And then it says... Um, this is the passage we're going to look at today, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Believers don't love the world. We're going to talk about that because there's a lot of confusion about what that means. Uh, because you may have heard, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, didn't God love the world? Well, we'll, get, we'll talk about that in a minute. 
Um, look at 1 John 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, believers care for the needs of their brothers and sisters. It, you know, it's one thing, and James says this. It's one thing to see your brother and sister and say, hey, have a good day and that. But when you see them and they have a need and you don't meet that need and you, you don't do anything, you're not being a good brother or sister. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus, you should be a good brother or sister. Um, here's another one. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Believers teach that Jesus Christ came in the flesh from God. Uh, so one of the things we see in the, in the uh, first John, the epistle of 1 John, is that the, er, there was a cult, there was a false teaching going on within the church. And it was that Jesus was like a phantom. He was like a ghost. He, wasn't, he didn't really have a physical body. But if you read the first few verses, John, John says, we grasp him. We held on to him. In other words, he had a physical body. He had a physical body. And he basically says, uh, real believers believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that God became man. Uh, and so John basically says that. And then one more. In 1 John 5, verse 2, um, believers love God and carry out his commands. Now, he sometimes repeats these through there. But generally, you get an idea, you get a whiff of what John is saying here. He's basically telling us that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, these things ought to be true in your life. And if they're not, something's wrong, okay? So let's look at the passage that we're going to look at. And if you're joining us online, we're in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And uh, we'll read, I'll read through verse 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love of the, for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. All right, so the question is, should we love the world? Should we love the world? Now, some of you know there's a verse in the Bible somewhere, and it goes like this. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting right. That's life. That's John 3.16, written by the same John who's writing now in the verse that we just read, the passage we just read. It says, don't love the world. What's going on? Now, some people would say, oh, well, there it is. There's a contradiction in the Bible. And many people, most of them, who probably the vast majority of them, who have never read through the Scripture, who have never given it the benefit of a doubt, who have never understood the literature of the Bible, and have never taken time to investigate uh, other than on a surface level, would say there's a contradiction. But is it a contradiction? Well, no, it's not a contradiction, and here's why. The Greek word cosmos for world is used in at least three different ways. Here's how the world is, is used. One, for the physical world, the creation, the stars, the moon, the, the, the earth, the oceans, the seas, the mountains, the vegetation, the flora, the fauna. It's talking about the world. In the beginning, the God made the heavens and the earth. God created things, right? The earth, the physical earth, okay? So... That's one way the world is used in Scripture. Secondly, the world is used for mankind or people, okay? So one of the things that we're told in Scripture very early on in the book of Genesis is that every person that you come in contact with is made in the image of God is due dignity and respect because they are made in the image of God. James says in his epistle, it's very interesting, he says, we looked at this a while ago, James says, we praise God with our lips and we curse those who are made in the image of God with those same lips. And he says, brothers, these things should not be. So I just want to say to you that whenever you come into contact, whoever you come in with contact with, this week, whether they're a, a, a brother or sister in Christ or they're not yet, they are made in the image of God. And you as a Christian should treat them with dignity and respect, no matter their race, sexuality, whatever view they have on anything, politics. They are not the enemy. I know there is a, 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 a lot of hostility and a lot of throwing you know, names back and forth and a lot of anger and a, and a lot of just 
just the bad stuff going on. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you lock eyes with another person, they are made in the image of God. And your responsibility as a follower of Jesus Christ is to treat that person with dignity and respect and love. And Jesus did say, even if they are your enemy, you're supposed to forgive them. Oh, snap. <laughs> right? That's the second way. So it's the physical planet, it's people, and then this is the third way, which John is using. John is describing a world system that is anti-God, that is basically live for now, that is very pantheistic, which is very, um, it is just hedonistic. It's, it's basically live for now, grab the gusto, and it's an anti-God. There is no God. This is all you have is this life. And you may as well grab and live and grab life at, as you can. Just go for it. That's the, wor- the life or the world that John is talking about. It's a system that's empowered by the enemy. It's characterized by idol, uh, being uh, uh, idols and uh, loving this world. Um, it's called worldliness. Let me define for you a minute worldliness. Worldliness is a system of thinking that all there exists is this material universe. There's no God. There's no creation. There's no no sustainer. It's a value system. And the mindset is there's no place for God. And you have to live for today and you have to live for yourself. Here's what worldliness isn't. God, when John calls us to hate the world, he's not calling us to hate our planet. In fact, we should love this planet and enjoy this planet because God has given it to us to love and to be good stewards and to enjoy it. And that means we are to manage it and to care for it. And we ought to conserve. And we, Because there's a mentality within Christianity that says, oh, the world's all going to get burned up anyway, so it doesn't matter if I conserve or whatever. And I just want to tell you, you should be a good geek. You should be a good earth keeper. You should conserve. You should recycle. You, because we should love this planet and take care of it. Secondly, we should love people. And we should care about people and care for people. Um, we, we should see them as image bearers of God and love them. Um, I just want to stop for a minute because there's a mentality going on within the Christian church today that it's more important to be right than to love. And the idea is this, that we we see all these things happening in our society that we don't like as Christians in our culture. And we want to, what I call, howl at the moon. We want to complain we want to call them out. We want to condemn. We want to do all those things. And, and I, I would agree with Scripture. There's, you know, we live in a, in a dark world, and I believe it's getting darker. No, no question about it. But I think there's a point where some people say, we need to get this person in the right political party. We need to get this person on the right side of sexuality. We need to get this right this person on the right side of abortion. We need to get this person, and you can list whatever, whatever hot button topic you want. And the idea is, let's get them on the right side of this because that's the most important thing. And I just want to tell you, even if you get every one of these people on every right hot button issue, and they don't know Jesus, what have we accomplished? What have we done? And so I want to suggest you a different path. And I think it's the path of Scripture. I think it's the path of Jesus. John says in John 3.16, he did not come in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I think we ought to, instead of condemning people around us and condemning the world around us all the time, we ought to find ways to build bridges and to build friendships and to build relationships. Yes, we still hold on to our values, but we lead with, with the fruit of the Spirit rather than doctrine. 
instead of making doctrine a wall and condemning people, we begin to love people. We begin to listen to people. We do begin to care for people. And then doors may open up and we can help them take another step towards Jesus because when Jesus gets a hold of a heart, everything changes in that person's life and you are examples of that. Your lives are very different than before Jesus came into your heart. So why do we expect that anybody else is going to change before Jesus takes residence in their life? I'm just concerned, folks. I'm concerned about listening to the world system that says condemn them, they're the enemy. Beat them down. Show them they're wrong. Does that work with your kids? I didn't find that worked with my kids. You're wrong! I don't care if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm still going to do it. <laughs> right? You say, well, you know what? Let's just love each other. I'm going to love you, and I'll be there for you, and I'm going to pray for you. I just think it's a different way. And I think that's what it means. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Care for them. You know, you can win, win an argument, but winning hearts is really more important. It takes a lot more work, and it's a lot messier. And people say you're liberal and all that other stuff. So what is worldliness? Well, the word, the word that John uses here is, is epithumia. And thumia is a, a word that call, it's just called lust. It's loving things. And epi is a preposition. You remember those pesky pres, prepositions that changes things? And so it's added to the word. It just means to overlove. You love it, but you really love it too much. Like some people would say, oh, I love food. No, you love food too much. You know? And, and that's the point. That's what he's saying. So he gives like three things. He, call, he talks about the lusts of the body. Um, so, you know, there's a number of areas uh, in, in, you know, the lusts of the body. There's food and drink and rest and leisure and love and sex. Uh, and so one of the ways that, that, that um, lust is, is demonstrated in our culture and it's front and center is, is this idea of hedonism, the, the pursuit of pleasure. The pursuit of pleasure. TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. It's time to pursue pleasure. And hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure over everything. You, you know, there used to be a, a beer commercial, and they used to say, you only go around once in life, so go for the gusto. You know, and I know, it's a great voice, wasn't it? I was working on it all week. <laughs> I think I got indigestion or something like that. But I want to ask you a question. Are you a Christian hedonist? You say, well, wait a minute. I thought hedonism is a bad thing. I thought hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure over everything and excluding God. Well, it is. But I said a Christian hedonist. A Christian hedonist is somebody who pursues God and their desire is for God over everyone and everything. They find their ultimate drive, purpose, pleasure in pursuing God. They go hard after God. I like how C.S. Here's what I found. When we pursue pleasure... For pleasure's sake, it never fills, and it always leaves us empty. When we pursue God for God's sake, it always fills. It always captivates our heart. It always brings purpose and meaning and pleasure. C.S. Lewis wrote this in The Weight of Glory. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition uh, when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. We pursue pleasure, and we find it empty. But I'll tell you this, when you pursue God, you will never find emptiness. You will find fullness and richness and life and purpose. I 
Well, he talks about the lust of the flesh. And we think of things like eating. Eating's not a bad thing. In fact, it's pretty important. For some of you, it seems like it's really important. But I won't go into that. But, you know, there are a, there are a number of eating disorders, right? That goes into a whole body image thing, which is tied into all of this. But using food uh, as a way to control, uh, you know, to cope or control your world, some, some of us do that, right? Chocolate or other things like that. Um, or drinking. Um, there are some people that I've met that basically they use alcohol to manage life. I've seen people absolutely destroy their lives through alcohol and alcoholism. Uh, because they can't cope with life, so they want to blur life. Um, let me give you another one, and this is one that many of you will... Okay, so this is where some of you are going to feel very uncomfortable. And if, if you do, then I'm, I'm right on the money here. I mean, I'm right where I need to be. Um, more and more people I find, especially Christians, are pursuing pleasure in the area of leisure. Rest and relaxation. Um, because they find their jobs unfulfilling, so anytime they can find leisure, rest and... Re now, listen, I, what I'm not saying is this, that you shouldn't find leisure, and you shouldn't find rest and relaxation. But what I'm finding is many Christians are saying leisure and rest and re relaxation, man, that is what I have to have. I have to have it or I will not survive. And they go all out. And Christians have allowed the pursuit of leisure to crowd out the pursuit of gathering together with other believers and worshiping God. They've gone out and they've worshipped creation. They've worshipped le leisure. They've worshipped relaxation. But they have not gathered together with other believers to worship God, to pursue God. This is a problem. John tells us that if we are true believers, we will love God and our brothers and sisters, and we will choose God and pursue God and pursue relationships with our brothers and sisters because they bring life and refreshing and hope and joy and all those things. I mean, I want to just tell you that I'm alarmed at how many Christians are out pursuing leisure and they're not gathering together with other believers they've forsaken assembly as Hebrews writes together and they wonder why their lives are empty and they wonder why they're not they're, they don't have other friends along encouraging them when difficult times get difficult Here, here's what I'm saying eating and drinking rest and leisure are all God given at activities and we should enjoy them but when we over desire them when we seek them as kind of a replacement of seeking God then we have become worldly that's the point that John is making when you take something that good and it becomes a drive of your life you're acting like an unbeliever you're acting worldly he talks about the lust of the eyes so the over desire of the eyes to have uh to do it really has to do with appearance you know an example is when uh, we need money or we need a status or clothing or, or a certain body image so that um people look up to us and we look after things, or we look after things on a, a consumer uh, level in a sense that if I have this, if I can just purchase this, then, then I will be happy. If I can just drive this kind of car and live in this kind of house in this neighborhood, if I can wear these kind of clothes, then, then I will be happy, and then I will be fulfilled, and then my life will have purpose and meaning. I've over-desired those things, and we've allowed these things to dominate our lives. So the lust of the eye has to do with really materialism um, and if you're really a materialistic person then you're really tied to money and and uh, you, you let me give you a test because 
Again, this is a test within the test of 1 John. But let me give you a test. You may say, well, I am a Christian and I believe in heaven and I know that there's an eternity, but most of your money uh, in this world, most of this, your money and most of your time is spent on pursuing materialism, pursuing pleasure, pursuing recreation, um, cars, vacation. Um, and if, if that's your focus, you're probably a worldly person. That's kind of what John's saying. So let's talk about money for a minute. I mean, after all, I'm leaving, so now's the time to talk about it, right? <laughs> um, what's money to you? Do you see money as a tool given for the kingdom of God, or really as something you should spend on yourself. If you have extra, oh, good for me. Do you see yourself as the owner of your money or merely a steward that one day you're going to have to give an account for what God has given you as far as these resources? Are you spending your money here and now, or are you investing and sending it ahead? where moth and rust won't corrupt it, destroy it. You know, it's interesting. One of the richest men in the world, Warren Buffett, billionaire. Can't even conceive of billions of dollars. He's a billionaire. And he, he is going to, he has a plan. It's he, all of his money, billions of dollars he's giving away. And not only that, he's encouraging. Listen, some of you are getting caught up in, I don't like Warren Buffett. Yeah, play along with me, will you? Just play along with me. He's giving all of his money away, and he's encouraging billionaires to give their money away to good causes, whatever those good causes are. He's having them sign up and give their money away. He has figured out what Christians should know already. You can't take it with you. We should be setting the example of that, not Warren Buffett. Though I applaud him for his perspective. How about the pride of life? You know, each of these lusts get a little bit deeper and a little darker. The pride of life manifests itself in a couple of ways. First, it's one of those ways of saying, look at me. We want attention. We want people to see us. We want likes, we want views, we want people to notice us, we want to be popular. And boy, social media has just blown that all up lately. But it's not just about popularity, it's about power and control. We want to have control over things, we want to have power over people. So here's, here's, here's what I want you to see. If you're living for money or sex or power or pleasure, career advancement or image, this pursuit, this all-out pursuit, is called worldliness in the New Testament. That's what John's calling us out on. If this is what you spend the majority of your time and your money and your resources pursuing, then you are acting as an unbeliever. That's John's point. If you're living in the world and you're loving it, and again, love the planet, love the people, but don't fall in love with the system and don't allow the system to control you. Don't allow the system to say, if you come after me, you will find everything that you want. You know, the example that I remember is um, worldliness means that you're seeking the love and acceptance in all the wrong places. The example, the, one of the greatest examples is in John chapter 4, again, written by the Apostle John. And this woman comes to Jesus and he asks her for a drink and she's, she's surprised that he even had a conversation with her because of the social structure of that day. And um, 
Jesus says, well, um, if you were to ask me, I would give you this living water. And it would come welling up. It would fill your life, and it would come welling up. And the woman is still thinking of just the well water. She says, well, that'd be great, because then I wouldn't have to come to the well every day and don't really like that. And So, he, you know, so you think, okay, so what is Jesus going to say next? And what he says is really surprising. It's like they're talking about water, 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 and then uh, he just does it like a turn. He says, yeah, go get your husband. And she goes, uh, bu, 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 bu. <laughs> yeah. my husband. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not married. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm not married. And Jesus goes, you're right. You're not married. You've been married this many times. And the person, the man you're with is not your husband right now. Now, what was he doing there? Was Jesus making a moral choice? Well, yeah, he was, but he was making a deeper point. What was he saying to the woman? He was saying, and by the way, if you're a woman watching this, I want to just challenge you to think through this. He was saying to this woman, don't ask a man to fill your life because they can't. There's no perfect man out there that will fill the void in your life. They can give you a certain level of security and significance and satisfaction, but they're going to fall short. You are going to lay your head on your pillow, and you're going to say, there's only one person. And it's interesting the picture Jesus gave. He gave the living water that fills every crack of your life. And what Jesus was saying is, when you pursue me, when you become a Christian hedonist, and you pursue me with all that you have, I will fill every crack of your life, every void, every bit of emptiness, and I will give you purpose and meaning and joy, and I will just give you life. Until you come to a place where you understand the Father in heaven is the only place where you will find that emptiness filled. And as you pursue him with all your heart, when you over-desire, you can't over-desire the Father. But when you desire him, when you, when you l allow the Father, you lean into the Father's love and you become enamored with it and amazed by it and driven by it and, and, and just called to it when you find that love you will be you will find yourself carried you will find yourself loved he calls you his, his son and daughter and and he's already invested so much he sent his son jesus for you he's given you everything and he will hold nothing back from you if you bask in his love you will Cast out and cast off the unhealthy love for this world. John says, don't love the world. The world system is empty. And all of its promises are empty. Latch yourself on to the Father. Pursue the Father. Desire the Father. Let me ask you one last question. Is Jesus worth the effort, the pain, the sacrifice that it will take to overcome the pull of this world so that you can seek his kingdom and his righteousness? Because Jesus said, seek ye first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Do you believe that? Do you believe an all-out pursuit of the Savior will bring purpose and meaning, and joy, and everything that you need into your life? Well, this week we'll answer that question through your words, through your actions, and through your life. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father, help us, because without your help, we can't do this. We pray that your spirit that you've given to us will guide us and direct us into all truth. We pray that we would love the earth, the planet, 
and be good stewards, that we would love people who are made in your image, but that we would not love this world system that has been controlled by the dark forces, that we would not be pulled in, that we would seek and pursue you, that we would enjoy the things that you've given to us, but not overindulge and over-desire them. For they will destroy us. Thank you for John who's given us this self-examination test. May we take it to heart and may your spirit point out areas in our lives that we've allowed to become worldly. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.